Um, so thank you very much again for this nice introduction and also for the invitation. I'm very pleased to be here and to present my work here. It is only a pilot study, so it is only like a beginning, which I hope will then um, develop into further studies. Uh, particularly, I'm now waiting for um, a response of potential funding that will allow me then to expand on this pilot study. So I really very well, very much also welcome any feedback that you may have on how to improve the design of this study. So we're going to have to start with the like what motivates this this study specifically is that, um, as you all know, um, the UN uh, in 2015, um, you, you, the UN has agreed um, sustainable development goals, 17 goals, um, to kind of you know bring forward the world on the path of sustainable development, um, and with great emphasis on protecting the environment, uh, protecting the planet, making it livable for future generations um, as well. And so, and of course that kind of reflects the big challenge that at the moment all societies around the world are facing, namely how to transition it to becoming more sustainable, to make sure that we, you know, live um, a fair and good lives without destroying um, the, the, the environmental resources that we all depend on. Along with this, um, issue or kind of launching of those sustainable development goals. Um, there was also um, the general um, secretary Ban Ki-moon, he also asked an independent um, advisory uh, group to make concrete recommendations how new technologies, how new types of data can be used to support this transition to more sustainable um, development paths. And there are, since then, you know, there were many initiatives um, that uh, came about to respond to this call uh, to, to see how we can use new types of data, new types of technologies to generate data that will allow us to monitor our progress on sustainable development goals, but also ultimately, and of course, that's what I'm interested in, to what extent we can actually make use of those technologies to maybe, uh, you know, um, intervene to, to, to issue some interventions that to help uh, people and societies to encourage them to change behaviors that are, um, you know, that are contributing to the problem, problems that we are facing um, as a society to the destruction of, um, of natural resources and so on. So kind of changing the behavior for um, the social good. And you see here, uh, I kind of highlighted a few, a few kind of uh, bits here in those, in, uh, in those uh, initiatives. There's, for instance, mobile phone services to be or using mobile phone um, data, using GPS devices and so on to, to generate new types of data. Generally, if we're kind of focusing on sustainability, it kind of seems obvious what the right thing to do, right? So we all know what we have to do and you know how it can contribute to the good uh, of the world, right? Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be that easy um, as it you know as we would hope it would be. And part of the problem why why it is so difficult to make this transition to kind of transition into more sustainable developments is of course that at the core of the sustainability challenge there is the social dilemma problem so or also called the tragedy um, of the commons so that means that kind of a preserved environment is of course a common good that everyone would benefit uh, from you know if if we, if we contribute to it um, however cooperation um, you know is required to achieve this common good and cooperation of course comes at costs uh, at the individual level and that of course prevents many people from actually cooperating from contributing to this common good and that's a common behavior, not just in terms of sustainability. We see that kind of social dilemma problems all across, you know, societal issues that we are facing, right? So, you know, social dilemmas appear in, you know, when civil society relies on volunteering, democracies rely on active democratic participation of its citizens, public spaces rely on people, you know, regarding each other's uh, rights to use those public spaces and so on. So given this kind of pervasiveness um, um, of, of social dilemmas, it is not surprising that kind of making any progress on, on kind of trying to, 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 to kind of solve those social dilemma issues or better understand them at least would really you know, be a big progress for, for society. And um, that's what we kind of, of course, try to contribute to with our study. So we want to study environmental behavior in real life social dilemma situations by exploiting kind of smartphone technology to collect new types of living laboratory data. So living laboratory data, that's, that's uh, an expression that um, Alex Pentland has coined. So he first kind of used this, uh, this term to, um, to kind of describe the type of data that you can collect with those new sensing kind of technologies, mobile devices, and so on. <laughs> 
and maybe as a last kind of you know reason for motivation because this is a feedback i get quite a lot so a lot uh, of people are saying so should we not actually focus on structural change you know or, or political change to kind of um to kind of make progress in sustainability why should like you know individuals change their behavior stuff like that so should not like first uh, you know the big things the big changes happen and i think so this is a tweet by edgar mcgregor he's a he's a un um, us climate activist um he's 20 years old um and he's very kind of involved in this kind of whole climate change protest movement and i think his tweet is kind of giving a very good response to that kind of feedback um, yes, we definitely need political, you know, change. We need, we need to make political decisions, and we need to have structural change. Absolutely, but we also need um, behavioral change on individual level. Because, for instance, um, there is no way we could ever meet the Paris, uh, you know, Paris Agreement goals if uh, people continue to consume meat and dairy products on the same level they do at the moment. I mean, you know, scientists have calculated that, like to what extent, like you know, um, this is not sustainable right but you know a government you know a government deciding that people should not eat you know certain products is usually not very popular right i mean for instance denmark you probably have heard it about in the news um denmark kind of introduced two vegetarian um days in in public canteens um and they had to make a u-turn on this decision just two weeks after they um, made this made this kind of um made this decision because people were so discontent about this um, this kind of decision, right? So it doesn't go without any individual uh, lifestyle changes. It will not work. And um, as this kind of tweet also suggests, those two things are, of course, also related. And one thing can fuel the other. So for instance, we're much more likely to vote for political uh, parties, for political candidates that are standing for robust climate change action uh, if we are ourselves ready to actually change some of our uh, you know, lifestyle choices. So um, that's a motivation why I think we should also, beside the other things, also focus on individual and individual behavior change. Okay, so now let's go to the um, uh, to to the actual uh, study. So why should we actually use you know smartphones and why field experiments? So. Big data is, of course, increasingly used for human behavior research. Uh, so, for instance, you know, you know, people collecting you know, retailers' loyalty card data, smart meter data, and so on. One problem that we quite often have with um, with kind of just big data is that it's purely observatory data, and um, that quite often you know limits the kind of conclusions we can make from that kind of data. And also because we don't design to have like specific data that we want to collect, it is the data that is out there, and it's not always the best data we can have to answer certain questions. So, for instance, to give you an example, there was a study that um, Horney Brook et al. have conducted um, with a royalty card. Um, of retailers, retailers loyalty card data and they they were not able to explain kind of why the introduction of carbon labeling uh, on supermarket products did not have any impact on customers choices um, they, because they, the loyalty card data that they used to analyze um, this kind of behavior did not, did not provide any answer to that kind of question so they had in the end kind of conduct focus groups to talk to consumers and to customers to be able to understand what the reasons were for the lack of impact of this, um, of this kind of um, labeling. Um, so another approach is, of course, experiments, laboratory experiments um, that allow us to understand kind of more the causal mechanisms uh, behind, you know, certain phenomena. And experiments were indeed like quite, um, you know, did a lot of contribution did contribute a lot to understanding, for instance, social dilemma problems and how we can uh, solve them. So, for instance, they showed that uh, public goods um, can be produced in the presence of repeated interactions, uh, which facilitate reciprocation um, and uh, reputation effects and punishment uh, or um, relatedness. So, there are different kind of you know different factors that contribute to um, sustaining public goods. And experiments have shown that. But one problem that you know laboratory experiments have that kind of use, for instance, a lot of games, uh, social, you know, public goods games to understand, you know, people's um, decision making in terms of uh, public goods, is that there are quite that, that sometimes there is a weak correspondence between, like, you know, what the laboratory experiment tells us and field experiments. So there have been, for instance, studies that were trying to, you know, to test the same thing in a field experiment was set up and in a laboratory experiment set up, and they not always uh, produce the same um, results. So we cannot always then make conclusions about the real life. 
um, and real life you know, decision making um, from you know, laboratory experiments. So smartphones or kind of the idea of this study was kind of to combine in a way both. So combine kind of the big data approach uh, with a field experimental design um, to kind of, you know, um, to use basically those technologies to create uh, and uh, living laboratory data that allows us basically to study human behavior in real life, in real life social dilemma situations, um, but using kind of new types of data to collect, um, you know, those behavioral um, data. And smartphones are, of course, increasingly used in, uh, in just study people's daily uh, lives and people's behavior, uh, taking, for instance, you know, um, measuring social interactions uh, or their mobility routines and so on. And field experiments are as well a, a very kind of prominent field of social science that is increasingly becoming popular. Um, and you know, that's used to study all kind of phenomena from uh, crime to employment, uh, discrimination, political participation, um, and so on. So the idea was kind of to combine the two to kind of, you know, um, to make use of the benefits of those both um, approaches. When we're using smartphones to kind of uh, collect data, there are different ways to, to do that. We can, of course, um, just, you know, make smartphone sensing studies, so kind of basically um, collect sense, sensing data such as uh, call logs, uh, short messages, you know, battery status logs, accelerometers, um, GP, GPS and so on. So different kind of uh, sensing, um, you know, sensing data that um, we can we can collect through existing um, smartphone you know, applications um, and so on. And there are specific dedicated um, apps as well that you know that are also freely available for researchers to, for instance, collect that type of data, like for instance the Record Me or UPay. Um, however, that's again um, usually creating um, observatory data um, and it's not always easy to, um, to infer from this kind of sensing data the actual type of um, behavior that we are interested in. So for instance, to infer, for instance, from the accelerometer data, the type of transport mode that, um, that a user is using to get from A to B. And people were trying to do that, but it is, it is quite challenging to do that. Another way to collect data for smartphones is um, kind of bespoke self-monitoring applications, so a specific app that is kind of designed to, for instance, ask people questions uh, on the smartphone. Um, so that's also called the ecological monetary assessment, or um, to kind of have it within a game that people have to play, and that game kind of generates um, you know, certain, uh, certain data as well. Um, and of course, one can combine the two. So one can, for instance, you know, um, have sensing kind of collect um, data uh, that kind of uh, sensing data collected that is kind of linked to those ecological monetary assessments for instance um, that a gps record that is collected is kind of triggering the questions so what are you doing here um, so then we can kind of link the location information with a more kind of substantial information about what the user is doing um, in a specific location Smartphone-based kind of studies with experimental design um, means that we use smartphones not only to actually collect the data um, on behaviors, but also to, you know, inside behavioral changes through some interventions for some treatments that we deliver through those uh, smartphone applications. The largest bulk of, 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 of studies um, so far um, that have been using this kind of approach were in medical research, and that's where like most advances have been made so far. So they, there's a whole actually area research area known as the mobile health or M health um, research that has emerged from that, um, and the goal is quite often to basically try to. Um, identify behaviors that lead to positive or negative health outcomes um, and then to in order in, in the end to design large scale kind of interventions, um, health, public health interventions. Um, most studies uh, that kind of using this approach uh, in, in health research have been using, you know, SMS or other types of messaging services to issue interventions. So it's kind of nudging interventions that were uh, tested in that context usually. Um, 
it, much rarer is the case that you know more complex type of interventions or treatments are are, are kind of measured or 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 are um, attempted. One example for it is the Active Together app um, that not only intervenes through kind of some nudging messages, but also additionally um, facilitates social comparison um, to encourage physical activity. So based on Facebook um, network, a friendship network, the app kind of provides a group averages um, on, on the group level and ranks kind of the user's performance within this kind of list of users to basically motivate the user to, you know, you know, do more physical activities. Ultimately, of course, that's the goal uh, of this um, of this study. Um, within environmental behavior, um, there are actually very few studies that kind of try to to use this kind of approach in, in, in to, in, to measure and to change environmental behavior. Um, the closest one gets is kind of actually in the transport studies. Um, so for instance, this report here, um, here they, um, they, they were trying to use um, the equation, which is called on track, um, that would capture carbon emissions and calories um, burned associated with certain transport modes that, uh, that users would use. Um, and they kind of assessed the impact of the behavioral nudges. Again, this was nudging intervention. So of course, some messages uh, that you know people were encouraged to change their behavior, um, and uh, in, in a randomized controlled trial. Um, they had, which is interesting as well here, so here they used a sensing data um, collection as well to actually estimate or to try to infer uh, transport mode. So they used an accelerometer um, to detect automatically whether someone is walking or cycling. However, for other types of transport modes like car usage or trains, um, it was not good enough because the speeds are very, very similar. And so it's not possible really from just the accelerometer data to then, you know, infer um, the specific transport modes. So for that, the, the, the users had to specifically say or specify uh, the transport mode that they were using. And, you know, it, uh, they, they found some effects uh, of this intervention that, uh, you know, that um, people did then kind of um, over the course of the study um, change and moved more towards more sustainable transport modes. Um, the problem with this kind of um, study was that they kind of mixed env environmental awareness and health awareness um, nudges together. And it's kind of difficult to understand what exactly had the effect. So was it the environmental awareness that made people change, you know, their transport modes or was it more that they were that they want to improve their health. <clears throat> okay, so in, in our study, what we were proposing in terms of innovation is actually studying kind of more complex uh, social choice behaviors um, in, within kind of um, social dilemma uh, contexts. Um, and kind of collect multidimensional behavior data. So not just, for instance, transport or, you know, or in other studies, like, you know, it would be something other, like, you know, that, that it focuses on, but kind of um, capturing different types of environmental behavior. So kind of related to transport, to energy consumption, food, and so on, and simultaneously. And that's because we think that there are important interactions between those behaviors that we have to account for if we are trying to study them. So for instance, there have been some research on the moral credential effect. And that basically says that if one person decides to kind of um, to choose an environmentally friendly um, behavior in one context, let's say you decided that today they're going to cycle to work, that they feel morally um, kind of entitled to be less environmentally friendly in a, in a different context. So for instance, then they said, okay, so I did cycle today to work, but so I can now allow to have like a beef steak for lunch, something like this. <clears throat> so kind of to, to account to understand those interactions between different kind of environmental dimension behaviors, we, we kind of wanted to collect um, the different types of behaviors that are to do with environment. And another invent, innovation kind of in our study was kind of that we wanted to um, implement bespoke, um, so, so several multiple bespoke ex experimental interventions. So going beyond just the nudging, but also looking into other potential treatments um, that could be useful uh, to uh, change behavior in the environmental um, context. <clears throat> so the kind of, as I said, the type of behavior that we have studied in our, um, in our pilot study was transport uh, behavior, energy consumption, food consumption, goods consumption, so just generally kind of consumption and wasting behavior. And we collected da the data um, daily um, 
via this smartphone application over two weeks. And we used a randomized field experimental design. So I'm going to explain that a bit um, later. So we didn't reuse a randomized controlled trial and design because we had too few participants in the pilot study. So we uh, opted for having two different uh, intervention groups, uh, but then kind of issuing the intervention in, in the later stage of this of the data collection. But of course, in a proper study, you need to have a control group. That's absolutely uh, for sure. But I'm going to talk about that later uh, in a bit. The smart up smartphone application that we used was um, AP Collect. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mobile and web application that has been developed by um, Imperial College London. Um, and um, it was used for data collection purposes in, in this context. The platform kind of allows to create project specific um, smartphone applications and then um, they, um, they, they can be then published through this AP Collect um, mobile phone application and it operates on iOS and, um, and Android smartphones. Um, the AP Collect is application um, allows to collect the following types of data. So you can collect multiple choice questions for, for text entries, GPS coordinates, images, videos, audio and barcodes. Um, and EpiCollect 5 also gives the user full control over the data that they are kind of producing to, to, through this application because the, the user has to actively upload the data ultimately to the server. So it's not something that is kind of done without their control in the background. So the user is really giving full control over the data. Um, we also actually worked on a, on a bespoke app and we at the moment is kind of a work in progress um, that we uh, that we are working on at the moment. So we want to automize many of the tasks that we uh, during the pilot study still had to do uh, kind of manually through a human operator because the Collect didn't, you know, um, include certain functionality. So our bespoke app, for instance, would then do uh, perform a simple statistical analysis um, um, of the collected data in the background to produce, for instance, some, uh, some graphs that try to summarize uh, users and group environmental performances that we can then kind of use uh, for, um, uh, for interventions. Uh, and um, also, we want to, um, the, the, the application is kind of the spoke application that we are working at the moment is also um, allowing us to automatically issue messages to, uh, to the users. Uh, so for instance, if for instance, they have not uploaded any data, they would be reminded of it. And also, for instance, um, nudging messages uh, for interventions. Um, so, and of course, like once we, we can do that kind of things to automate many of those kind of uh, functionalities, it is then possible to use that on much large scale or uh, in much large scale um, studies um, that we couldn't do like uh, in, in the pilot study. So in our pilot study, we had only 20 study, 20 study participants. Um, that was partly due to the restrictions, how much money we had, because we had only like a small pot of money uh, to be used to, uh, to do this pilot study. And it was really just, um, I mean, the whole kind of idea of this pilot study was really just to show feasibility of this kind of approach that it can work, that it can produce some meaningful, interesting data, that one can do this, uh, this kind of approach. So we only had 20 study participants, uh, 30 were students, including two postgraduates and seven professionals. Um, they all had higher educational background because they were, they were all recruited in the university kind of context. The, the age was uh, ranging between 18 and 45, uh, 43, and the mean was 25.7. We had eight male and 12 female participants. Um, and we compensated those participants with uh, 50 pound uh, Amazon vouchers. We kind of tried to make sure that there was, then, that there was no, inter no interference. So that means that we tried to make sure that the, you know, that the um, treatment in one, um, in one group does not affect the treatment in another group, for instance, through friends who, you know, who are two, two different groups. So kind of to try to avoid that, we kind of tried to recruit people from different courses, from different models, from different kind of years to avoid as much possible this kind of um, interference. We started to study with uh, first an online survey that all the participants had to do, where we collected data on their demographics and on, and on their attitudes towards climate change and other um, environmental issues. And then we also did another survey at the end of the study where we want to collect some feedback from this from study participants about like how to experience the users of the app, like what kind of improvements uh, would they suggest and so on. Um, the actual data collection for the app was then um, done over two weeks on a daily basis. So every day um, 
um, the, the, the data was collected throughout the day. So it, it's not like you, know, you had to use the, kind of the app um, on one specific time. You could like collect the data on one point and then come back again to it. Um, it overall, like, you know, it, it took around 12 minutes uh, to kind of do the different kind of tasks or the different questions uh, in, in, on this app. Um, and they then in the evening they were then kind of they were expected to upload the data to the server uh, if they uh, did not do so they would be reminded to do so um, and so on and um, they um, they also like you know had a choice for instance to opt out of certain data that if they didn't want for instance to share like gps data then they were allowed to opt out of that option um, <clears throat> So the data entry was for the AP Collect app, um, and the data that we collected was the date, um, then some text, um, checkbox information, so like kind of uh, those drop down uh, responses and so on, GPS, uh, barcode scans, for instance, for the type of products that they were buying, and images of their electric meter counter. And all that data we then uh, kind of translate into average CO2 emissions. And we used for that purpose, we used the book, um, How Bad Are Bananas um, by, um, by Bernice Lee. Um, and it kind of attempts to, um, to report food carbon footprints for everything, for all kinds of activities that you can think of uh, on everyday life. So that kind of allowed it to basically translate everything that the, the users were doing into CO2 emissions. And that kind of made, of course, um, it easy to compare across the different dimensions, but also kind of to do um, analysis, uh, statistical analysis later. Um, one thing maybe to mention here that kind of the reliance on people's accurate reporting um, of their environmental of their environmental activities is of course a problematic in a way. Um, you know, people could of course cheat or not report or lie, and of course that's a that's a problem or a weakness of of any kind of design that involves people you know giving answers or saying something about their behavior, their attitudes, and so on. Um, at least one can say that on a daily Kind of data collection level that there shouldn't be any problems with remembering so because people would not like you know have to think okay so like last week how much you know how much meat did they eat whatever so they they would kind of you know because it's a daily level um, they would remember should remember what they've been doing over the day um, but also because we did include some kind of more objective uh, data like for instance the images of the electric meter counters the barcode scans uh, and gps records we can in some ways uh, that allows us you know to verify some at least of the responses but of course there is this challenge um, that you know people may not respond always um, um, in, with, uh, in truthfully um, so with the intervention. So I said uh, already that, um, so at the first week, um, the 20 study participants were basically randomly assigned to, uh, to one of the two field experimental groups, each containing uh, 10 participants. Um, a control group was not included here because in the pilot study, um, because, because of financial restrictions that we had, and we could only compensate 20 study participants. So the primary goal was then kind of just to you know, show feasibility of this approach, um, particularly showing the feasibility of multiple interventions that one can study simultaneously you know, using this kind of smartphone um, approach. And it was, it was then decided to rather implement two different intervention groups rather than uh, a control group. But of course, um, I, you know, I, I absolutely agree on any critique of that, that, you know, for a proper study, one needs to have a control group, absolutely. And of course, that's what we plan to do in a, in a proper, in a proper follow-up study. Um, instead of like, but because, since we didn't have a control group to have some kind of reference uh, of comparison, we, we did the interventions only in the second uh, group, uh, in the second week of, of the data collection. In the first week, there was no interventions at all. So, you know, we could kind of collect the data uh, and see like how it looks like um, without any interventions and kind of compare it to the interventions um, in the second week. So we had two different interventions, um, behavioral targeting, um, where the study, study participants received um, individualized messages giving advice on how they could reduce their CO2 emissions. For instance, in the transport dimension using, let's say like a bus instead of a car. Um, and the advice was given based on their data ended in the previous day. So we analyzed kind of, it was analyzed, the data was analyzed that, you know, that they ended in the previous days. And if we kind of noted that, well, they, they were particularly high on CO2 emissions on the transport dimension, then they would get like um, an individualized message on, um, on, on that kind of and with some suggestions how to reduce that um, CO2 emissions in that case. So it was kind of based on, on, on in a way on match theory. 
The second, the second intervention was social monitoring. So here, study participants received messages that visualized um, their own environmental performance and um, from the previous day, as well as the environmental performance of, um, of others in their group. Um, of course, all were anonymized, so you know, we only used usernames, not actual clear names. Um, and you know, they will kind of see basically um, a, a via bar graphs, you know, the performance of different people in, in the group. And that's kind of based on social influence theory, assuming that people, you know, want to, when they see how others are doing, they want at least to be not, not worse than, than the others. Um, maybe like being better um, than the others. So I will not discuss the results from the pilot study in detail because of course there are so many limitations with the study. There is a small sample only, there is no control group. It was a too short period really to kind of for any consistent behavioral change. Um, so it any kind of you know substantive conclusion from that kind of uh, pilot study is not really um, you know responsible and should not be given. Um, however, you know, one can still see that there might be some interesting things to, 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 to realize from that pilot study that, you know, that one should then kind of um, investigate further in proper studies following up. And I think one interesting result that, you know, this pilot study um, produced was that, was that um, there was a clear difference between the two behavioral groups, uh, between the two behavioral interventions. And it, when we're looking here at, at, this, um, at this graph here, we see that the that ever CO2 emissions per day were lower in the social monitoring group, so where it's about social influence, um, compared to the behavioral targeting. So we had like lower CO2 emissions in this group, you know, consistently across those days, comparing to this, um, to the nudging kind of intervention. And again, like we obviously cannot make any, you know, any conclusive generalizations from that, but of course it may point that this is something interesting to, to further investigate in, in future uh, research. Um, to what extent maybe social based interventions are more effective than, you know, nudging interventions. Um, Another thing that we just wanted to show what we can do with this data as well. So, um, you know, we can, of course, like test for uh, the effectiveness of different treatments, but ultimately we need a control group for that. Um, another thing that we wanted to show is that that kind of data can be also used to do interesting choice models. Um, so again, there is, you know, we don't want like to make any, you know, any final conclusions from that kind of pilot study, but it shows that there might be some interesting patterns to see from that kind of data that can be done, you know, analyzed using uh, choice modeling. We specifically used the Gauss and Cross's choice models, which is kind of a non-parametric version of choice models, so kind of a machine learning based approach to choice modeling to allow for um, non-linear um, utility functions to be estimated. So kind of it's, it's based on, uh, on conditional logic models where we look into interaction between uh, the individual uh, characteristics and the choice characteristics and how they interact in producing utilities uh, for, uh, for, 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 for people on which basis then they make decisions. So we kind of had, of course, those individual characteristics from the initial survey data where we, you know, get some, got some information about their attitudes towards climate change, but also their, you know, demographics. And then we, of course, had um, the choice characteristics from the data that we collected through the app. So, for instance, the CO2 emissions um, and, and so on, or the distances, for instance. So based on that, we kind of uh, did some analysis with this with this choice models, and you know, again, without like you no know, uh, making any further conclusions, some interesting things that we, we did see in it was that, for instance, the distance, you know, not surprising, the distance does play a role when it comes to picking the, the, the kind of the transport mode, and of course, the more the more like the more distance uh, we have to travel, the more like CO2 emissions will be produced, and you know, at, at from a certain point, it becomes without any alternative really. But it does seem to be related to also um, people's, um, you know, financial situation. So um, people with uh, with kind of in, in more difficult financial situations usually have much lower uh, kind of options or much fewer options of transport modes than those with, um, with more financial situations. That's not much support, uh, much more surprising maybe. I think the interesting thing is that we do actually see that there is some effect from 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 attitudes towards climate change. So people who are really very concerned about climate change do indeed take more, um, you know, lower lower CO2 emission um, transport modes. So there is some effect from attitudes on on the on the choices on the behaviors we are seeing. I think this is quite interesting uh, as such because that's not always um, 
that's very clear that um, attitudes have actually this, this influence on behavior. Um, we also could see that there is a clear preference um, for transport that allow for, for independence. So people would prefer to like, for instance, on short, um, you know, and it does not always mean that the car which of course allows us to like you know, to be independent, but also for bikes and uh, and for walking on short distances, and while you know um, transport modes like buses and trains, which you know of course don't provide the same level of independence, are much less um, liked. And this is particularly true for all the participants. I suppose now with COVID, uh, it all there's also more kind of factors into it. We know now that kind of, of course, uh, people are more concerned about the health issues as well and are now more, again, get, getting back to using their cars rather than public transport. So there is uh, probably some interesting effect from that as well. So in the future, what do we want to do? We want to go beyond, of course, this pilot study. Um, in the action study, we want to collect the, the data um, and do the field of experimental um, interventions over a much longer period of time, at least a month, because we need to give people the, the time to adjust. You know, actually, we probably need even more than a month because it takes time to change behaviors, to change habits, and so on. And we got that also from you know many of our um, study participants, with whom like you know um, like in their in their several responses after their participation, they said like, oh, you know, I had to rebook the travel. You know, I couldn't like you know cancel my flight or you know I had already bought all those um, meat products you know so I had to, to eat them so you know it's it's um, it was kind of too, too little time for them really to adjust you know to any interventions. Um, we of course not need a control group absolutely to do a proper randomized controlled trial um, design. We need also much larger and much more representative, ideally representative samples, not just you know, people from you know, higher education background, but also people from all kinds of walks of life and backgrounds. We, you know, we have also some ideas for how to better um, design our app and also like the, kind of the questions that we do issue in this application based also on, on the participants' constructive feedback that we received. There's of course always kind of the, a bit the, the, um, the trade-off between having like much more detailed queries and you know, how much time we have to, um, how much time people need to, kind of to, um, to provide answers for the app. So we have to um, account for that. Um, and then of course we, of course, working that with our application, bespoke application to do, to automate many of the processes um, in, in the data collection process. And then we have also some more ideas about the kind of interventions we want to, st to study. So we have studied so far, there's two interventions. Um, the magic intervention didn't seem to be going that good. Um, the social intervention was a bit more promising, um, but ultimately there are many more you know, possible interventions that you know, are, could be very promising, for instance, reputation-based interventions. So in other laboratory experiments, we have seen that reputation systems can work very well in public goods context, that it can you know, um, make people to, um, to contribute um, to, to social uh, to, to the social goods to public goods so this is something we want to test then um, the value alignment intervention is actually quite interesting intervention based on a study from uh, Brian et al from 2019 they actually managed to counter the influence of extensive marketing for junk food um, on adolescents with interventions that kind of frames the manipulative uh, food marketing as incompatible with the values that those young people hold like for instance you know autonomy social justice autonomy from adult control so when kind of um kind of those those junk food was kind of associated with those kind of negative things it had an influence on, on people's uh, choices uh, with respect to the food they were buying uh, for instance in school canteens so that was kind of interesting thing and that's something that we might want to try as well uh when can of course try a financial incentive that's of course maybe less kind of innovative and then another thing we want maybe to try as well is kind of some kind of normative Socratic dialogue. So that's more, of course, we would have to do it automatic because we will not have actual person like talking to the people. But kind of the idea is kind of to, to trigger with some questions, critical thinking in people and through this critical thinking kind of to trigger ultimately a behavioral change by kind of questioning their kind of their whole assumptions and so on. So that's another thing that we kind of thought uh, might be interesting to try. Okay, so I think I'm finishing now, um, um, just to give a bit more time as well to, for some questions. So if you're interested to learn more about this study, we actually have published uh, a paper on this pilot study. Uh, we also published the data um, that, we that we 
collected in this study. It is available on um, UK Data Service and that can be downloaded and used if you want to use it with your students or whatever. Um, but yeah, so this is the paper um, and yeah, thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to questions and comments and critique. <laughs> thank you.